exercise obviously makes you much more insulin sensitive. So anybody that is exercising is going to need less insulin than the same you know, height, weight person that doesn't exercise. Exercise itself just makes the body more efficient, right? So maybe this person for the exact same meal needs two units, but they don't exercise. And this person, exact same height and weight, doesn't exercise. This person only needs one and a half units. So when you're exercising, not only do the cells upregulate a much higher concentration of GLUT4, so now it's su you know, you're super insulin sensitive, yeah. but some of those GLUT4s don't even need insulin. Some of those GLUT4s would just take in, take in glucose without the presence of insulin. Mm -hmm. Because the body, of course, is so brilliant that it's like, if this person is efforting and exercising, I want to make taking glucose into the muscles as easy as possible. Right. So the muscles literally can take in glucose without the presence of insulin during exercise. So the GLUT4 receptor concentration upregulate and stay upregulated from 24 to 48 hours after an exercise. And anybody that has more muscle mass in general has more GLUT4s 24 hours a day. So weightlifting specifically for people that want to increase their insulin sensitivity is actually even more important than cardio. It's more effective than cardio. What is up my friends? Welcome back to another video. I am so excited to share this episode with you. Uh, I, I think I'm particularly excited about this episode with Dr. Jody Sanislaw because it marries exercise, nutrition, and keto, and all the other lifestyle factors, stress, uh, inflammation, sedentary activity, how all these, not just diet, how all these other lifestyle factors that we all have sometimes control over or lack of control over and how those affect our ability to store uh, body fat, to access or burn body fat in our body's post-meal responses, uh, in, meaning uh, insulin responses and blood sugar regulation, we, we weave in all those concepts and it's loaded, loaded with sound bites. Uh, as you may have gathered from the introduction, Dr. Jody Sanislaw is a type 1 diabetic. And she, I think she was diagnosed, I can't remember exactly, I think when she was six or eight years old, something along those lines. So, you know, she's had a lot of years to figure out what affects her body's blood sugar, what affects insulin re response and release. Uh, how many days she can go without exercising before she notices that she needs to give herself more insulin, sleep and stress issues, um, psychological stresses, uh, cold and inflammation, like getting a, a, the flu or a cold. I mean, all this is just absolutely brilliant. Now, if I haven't mentioned it already, I'm being a little bit quiet because I'm in an Airbnb. There's people above me and below me in Breckenridge, Colorado. And I do want to let you know that if you want to watch the live stream, I'm at Low Carb Breck 2018. So uh, a past podcast guest, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, he talks all about insulin and how you know heart disease and atherosclerotic plaque formation is more than just you know cholesterol deposition within the arterial system. He, that's a great episode. I'll put it right here. Um, Anyway, he's been putting on this conference with a few other folks for the past couple of years, and I've been going for the past couple of years, and it's absolutely amazing. So if you want to check out the live stream of that, I'm not an affiliate of this at all. I just am a fan of helping you access more information. I'll put that link below this, and I don't know if they offer recordings or whatever, but I do know if you're watching this this weekend, this video with Dr. Jody, definitely check out the live stream uh, at Low Carb Rec. That being said, I will be doing some follow-up videos to help share with you some of the sound bites and tips that are offered from this conference uh, for those of you that live in other parts of the world and can't access this or you have family obligations and so forth. Now, with all that being said, I do want to let you know, and I mean this very, very sincerely, this podcast, this video-based podcast would not be made possible without Health IQ and Somnifix. Health IQ, as you may know, is a progressive life insurance company that rewards healthy people like you and I by helping us save money on our life insurance premiums. You see, by exercising, eating a low-carb ketogenic style diet, balancing your body's circadian rhythms, not eating junk food, and having a positive mindset, all those factors improve your body's health and resilience, and this whole network biology and will stave off and help to prevent diseases like type 2 diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Therefore, you can save more on your life insurance premiums and help your family, particularly if you have children. It's very, very important as a parent myself. I'm a huge promoter of having life insurance because you never know. We're, tomorrow is not guaranteed, folks and friends, unfortunately, for any one of us. And you need to have life insurance if you have dependents. So definitely check out the, the link right here. You can uh, just get a free quote and see if you qualify by going to healthiq.com forward slash H-I-H. That's healthiq.com forward slash H-I-H. 
So with that being said, let's dive into the show with Dr. Jody and talk about all the different non-dietary factors that affect your body's blood sugar regulation. Dexcom, it's mm -hmm. my favorite company. Uh, most accurate sensor, really. So I have a sensor right now in my arm yeah. and there's just a little, little filament, just like one centimeter long and I change it myself. The company says you have to change it every week, but I can make it last several weeks because each sensor is $80. Oh man, <laughs> cash or does insurance come uh, out? My insurance, everybody's plan's different, but I don't have coverage for it. Right. So um, this will shut down in a week hmm. and I just say, okay, I changed my sensor, come back on yeah. and it doesn't know. So um, yeah, so you ch the, the sensor is reading the blood glucose level in the extracellular fluid mm -hmm. um, and the interstitial fluid. Uh, which actually has a little bit of a delay, about a 20 minute delay from the actual blood sugar, blood glucose level. But it's, this is, it's just so accurate. I love it. It's, I've had diabetes for 37 years and it's the best advance I've ever seen. Yeah. I've ever seen. Because the alternative was, was what? I mean. Poking my finger 15 times a day. Yeah. Got old pretty quick, <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah. And also it gives you alarm, so um, I don't have to think as much. If I'm exercising or if I'm sleeping, I just put it next to me. And if it's not alarming, then I know I'm good, which That's is a huge piece of, it gives such peace of mind. Right. Yeah, on the ski hill, the, the manual meters get too cold and they don't work. Mm. So anytime I want to test my sugar level, I have to get off, go into the lodge, wait 10 minutes to have it warm up. Now I just put this in my pocket and if it's not beeping, I'm fine. Yeah. So it's true. amazing. So it will beep. You said you have the range set between 80 and 120. Yes. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Um, so I've used their freestyle, freestyle Libre uh -huh. habit. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that, that there, there was a huge, not a huge, but a, a fairly big disparity between the peripheral blood glucose monitor, mm -hmm. like just the one that Walgreens, I can't remember which one it was just, yeah. there's a bunch of them, right? Yes. It was, I think it, one, sometimes it was consistently low or sometimes consistently high. What have you found when you correlate, you know, the Dexcom between just the finger prick? Well, so because there's a 20 minute delay, um, mm. anytime my sugar level is headed up or headed down, this will always have lag. Gotcha. So the most accurate when I, the only time I get like what this number says is what the meter says is basically in the middle of the night where I have not eaten for hours. Sure. So when I'm just completely on a flat line. Um, right now, um, this says I'm 103, so mm -hmm. we can test my meter and see what it says. Oh, interesting. It was, you you to. were going to do that too, right? Yeah. Okay. You want to do that? That'd be cool. Um, when did you eat last? Uh, a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. And you were drinking a fermented drink, the Kavita, and then people also drink kombucha. Have you noticed that that affects your blood sugar much? Well, there's sugar in it. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And when I say sugar, it doesn't necessarily mean refined. You know, right. there's sugar in an apple, there's sugar in black beans, there's right. sugar in quinoa, in the sense that they are carbohydrates. So they eventually break down to glucose. Yeah. <laughs> so people are like, oh, there, there's sugar in kombucha? I'm like, well, I think that sugar source is coconut water. Mm -hmm. So there's sugar in that, yeah. Yeah. I should say glucose. Right, know, so. right. So, so there's a lot of people that, that 125. Kind of, so I I'm, see. so I am going to give myself a little bit of insulin because yeah. it's definitely trending up. Mm -hmm. So my belief is that in 20 minutes, this would say 125. Okay. We'll test it. I would be very curious to see. Yeah. I mean, that's such a cool yeah. way to do it. Um, so I don't see that as either one of these being inaccurate. Sure. Cause I did, um, I might've had something actually just an hour ago. So mm -hmm. that could be digesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll just give now we're taught to give these sub Q, mm -hmm. but um, I actually do my shots intramuscularly mm. because the increased blood flow there makes the absorption of the insulin twice as fast. Wow. So I just go right ahead and I fill it. Mm -hmm. Gosh, so, how long did that take you to get used to that? I mean, you had to, you have to do it to live. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was seven. Uh -huh. So yeah, I've done, a hundred or 200,000 shots in my life. I don't mm. know. I mean, I, it's just, so the muscle, most people won't be taught to give it in a muscle, uh, because it does hurt more. Yeah. Um, and people, I think a sub Q, I don't know. Doctors don't teach people to do it in a muscle. I think people probably wouldn't want to do it cause it hurts more. <laughs> right. But you just get used to it and you know that it's more effective. Yeah. So you don't need to use yeah. as much insulin if you go IM versus sub Q. Is that no? It just works faster. Fast insulin actually is not that fast. Mm. Um, it can take anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour to actually kick in and work well. P 
peak in an hour, eight hour and a half, depends. The more active you are in that moment after you shoot, yeah. the faster it works. Interesting. Because um, it has to find its way into the bloodstream. So that muscle is so, has so much more blood flow, obviously, than fat. Yeah. So the distance from where I just shot it to into the bloodstream is much shorter. Mm -hmm. And there's just it's just so much more blood for it to find right there than if I just grab a piece of fat and now the insulin has to find its way to the blood, you know? Yeah, it could be poorly vascularized and things. That makes exactly. a lot of sense. So it, um, it peaks faster and mm -hmm. then it's done faster as well. It's out of the system faster. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to kind of talk about I mean, all the different things that affect, you know, your blood sugar and then require more or less insulin. But, you know, one thing that we often don't talk about is some of the positive attributes of insulin. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, without insulin, I mean, we wouldn't be able to live, right? And so there's some beneficial things that insulin does, obviously, within the normal physiologic range. So what would happen if you didn't take your insulin? So insulin is the pickup truck for glucose, uh, right? So in a non-diabetic, the somebody eats anything with carbohydrates, they break down into glucose, the glucose is absorbed out of the GI tract into the bloodstream, and that sends a message to the pancreas, i.e. the beta cells, to make insulin. Because it's, you know, it's a assembly line and there's lots of different movement parts. So you eat, you chew, the glucose is in, the insulin is made. Now the insulin picks up that glucose and it feeds it to the cells. You don't want all the excess glucose floating in your blood you have to get it out of the blood. It's just a quick kind of, it's just a freeway. It's not at its destination in the blood. You don't mm. want too much. Um, you want a little bit of glucose in the blood, but as soon as you eat, it goes up and you don't want it to go up. So in, in you guys that don't have diabetes, you know, there's a range of like low normal, high normal. So when you eat, it just stays low normal, high normal because your insulin is immediately taking the high normal down. So the insulin picks up the glucose, feeds it to the cells. Um, there are receptors on cells, muscles, liver, and fat, actually. Mm -hmm. Lots of um, different cells in the body actually don't need insulin to take glucose in. The brain, for example. Um, the brain is, the second there's glucose in the blood, it can go to the brain. Um, it's a whole other topic. Ask me to bring that yeah, up. Yeah, I definitely later. want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because there's definitely a bad side to that. Mm -hmm. But, um, so... If I didn't have all of that insulin there, um, a couple very bad things would happen. Um, obviously, the blood glucose level would go to dangerous levels. Mm. Um, too much glucose in the blood is very damaging. It starts damaging the inner walls of arteries, causing microvascular damage, um, which then also damages various organs, um, leads to high blood sugar levels over a lifetime. Like if I, my blood sugar level was 200 or 300 right now, mm. I would be fine in the sense I could go drive, I could go out to dinner, I could go home, I could go to bed, I'm not gonna pass out or die. Would you feel irritated though? I would feel irritated, I wouldn't wanna to talk to you, right. I wouldn't be able to think clearly. Kids now are allowed to take an exam at a later date if their blood sugar level is high. Wow. They do not have to take an exam if because I, you can't think as clearly. Yeah. It's literally like you're so irritated with so much sugar in your blood, I just can't even, you know, I don't pick up the phone because I'm too cranky. Um, I think life is awful. I mean, it's just really dark. Yeah. And I was never told that all through my 20s. I just took Prozac and antidepressants and, you know, because my blood sugar levels back then, I'm sure, were way more roller coastery. But not a single doctor ever correlated with me like, oh, hey, flat blood sugar levels will make you feel better. Mm -hmm. Nobody told me that. Wow. You know, Gosh, I just crazy. thought, how oh, I am so tired and depressed all the time. Oh, oh. and I have diabetes, this other thing. Right. You know, so, and back then I was eating bagels and frozen yogurt for lunch and, you know. <laughs> because the, the, that, that was recommendations, right, from the Diabetes Association. It still so, is. Wow. Eat whatever that's, you want and take more insulin. That is crazy. Yeah. It, it's crazy. It's huh. awful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody is just being too sensitive. Like, oh, we want our kids to be like normal kids. I'm like, well, no, you don't. Because look at normal kids. Normal kids are getting type 2 diabetes. Right. <laughs> yeah. That is crazy. Um, Even at diabetes camps. They feed them pancakes and bread and macaroni and just take more insulin. Mm. And the problem with that is, and I'll, I will get back to your question, sure. what happens with no insulin. Yeah. The problem with that is insulin is a slug. Injected insulin is a slug. And if you eat a Slurpee or a bagel, your blood sugar level spikes. It can go from 80 to 300 in 30 minutes. Mm. I kid you not. It can go so fast. And 80 to 120 is normal. Um, so then the insulin is going to work at its own time. Is it going to peak in an hour? Is it going to peak in an hour and a half? You know, but meanwhile, 
you have a massive dose of glucose spiking the blood sugar level and you have a massive dose of insulin eventually working. What happens if they have a horribly slow digesting meal and they eat pizza and tons of fat and tons of protein on, on top of their carbs and their ice cream, right? Because the more protein and fat you put with the carb, the slower the digestion. Mm. Um, if you eat you know, straight jujubes or Slurpee, there's nothing slowing that down. That's just gonna spike you to 300. But the pizza can, and ice cream can spike very slowly because it's a much more complex meal with fat to slow down digestion. So all they're taught is if you eat 100 carbs, take 10 units of insulin. But they're not taught if the 100 carbs are gonna work quickly or if they're gonna work slowly. Mm. So how do they know um, if their insulin hits first? If you take, I only take one, two, maybe three units of insulin per meal. And if they're taking 10 units, what happens if 10 units of insulin hits them and their food hasn't digested yet? Yeah. Their blood sugar level is gonna drop so low they could pass out and die. You know, and, and even if, if the food hits first, then they go to 300 and eventually they come back down. Mm -hmm. Maybe if they can actually figure out how to dose right for that complex meal. So my general philosophy for all my type one diabetes patients is low carb, whole food. Mm -hmm. because it just takes you off the blood sugar roller coaster. Hey there, it's me again with a brief announcement from our show sponsor, Somnifix. As I'm sure you've heard before, breathing through your nose while you're sleeping is congruent with achieving deep, restorative phases of sleep. You see, if you're not getting deep sleep cycles and deep phases of sleep, uh, that can cause a cortisol release, that can cause inflammation, free radical stressors, that can suppress your growth hormone secretion. So sleep disordered breathing is a real phenomenon and one of the ways you can enhance your sleep quality is mouth tape. For me and many others, mouth taping has been one of the most impactful lifestyle changes that we've made. I would highly encourage you to try it and also try this with Somnifix because Somnifix is a hypoallergenic mouth tape. It was studied at Harvard and it really makes the practice of mouth taping so much more compliant and user-friendly. Click here or click below. You can find it on Amazon or at Somnifix.com. That's S-O-M-N-I-F-I-X.com. I would highly encourage you to check it out. So let's get back into the show with Dr. Jody. But let me get back to your question. Sure. So no insulin means that the blood sugar level starts spiking. It causes massive damage throughout the body. Blindness, heart disease, kidney failure, strokes, gangrene, limb amputations, because all that excess sugar is, is causing damage to nerve cells, damage to the arteries. Um, but like I said, this is high blood sugar level over decades yeah. and over years. You don't have a high blood sugar level and go blind the next day. Right. You have a high blood sugar level for decades and eventually go blind. Um, so those things eventually happen in the moment you feel awful and irritated but then there's a condition called diabetic ketoacidosis which can kill you and what that is is obviously your listeners know all about ketosis mm -hmm. and i have to constantly explain to people the difference yeah. of ketosis and diabetic ketoacidosis so ketosis obviously is a result of burning ketones for fuel so if the body doesn't get any, if it's not getting enough glucose, it burns fat for fuel. And then a byproduct of burning fat is um, keto acids, right? Keto. right. And the problem is when there's no insulin around, the body thinks it's an absolute emergency thinking. So the no insulin tells the body there's no fuel because right? Because normal people, when they eat, the body produces a little bit of insulin. So if the body sees insulin, the body thinks, oh, the body's being fed. Mm -hmm. But if the body sees no insulin, it thinks you're absolutely starving and it will go into burning fat at such a dangerously high rate that the byproduct of burning ketones creates such an acidic state in the body that um, you'll have labored breathing. Your whole pH of the body is off, yeah. right? So um, the acid, you, you become, your pH drops so much that you get labored breathing, that, it's, that you get sw sweaty, you get stomach aches, you get nauseous, you get vo you vomiting, you can have brain swelling, you can die from, um, you can die from your heart stopping. So it's very dangerous. Totally. Yeah, so yeah. anybody that goes into diabetic ketoacidosis, it's oftentimes if people are on an insulin pump and suddenly it's come undone or there's mm. bubbles in it and they didn't realize it, so they haven't had insulin for hours, so they have completely no insulin in the body. You always need a certain level of insulin, no matter right. what. Even people that eat um, you know, the keto diet, your body's still making insulin sure. at all times. Right. A type one diabetic, no. Zero. I constantly, I did a water fast for seven days. Wow. And yeah. I still took two, I generally take about 20 units of insulin a day total, 10 mm. units 
eight units long acting and then maybe two or three per meal. When I ate nothing, I still took two units of insulin a day. I took one unit in the morning and one unit at night. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to give that body, your body a little bit of insulin um, or else you'll die. Right. Because it, <laughs> insulin participates in other like anabolic processes, glutathione production. There's some, I can't remember what, what pathway or mechanism that I have heard that. So, um, like type one diabetics, if they don't take their insulin, won't they lose muscle mass too? Is that? They'll, they'll get into the hospital within mm. a few hours. Right. So. so it's necessary. So a certain amount, like you were saying, so insulin is good within the normal physiologic levels. Now, you said yeah. you take 20 units a day, some is with a meal, some is long lasting. Right. What would the average healthy, normal glycemic, physically active person, what would their pancreatic beta cells produce in a day? Is that about right? Well, yes, it is, mm -hmm. um, under 30 units. But the reality is your insulin is much more efficient. So the second I inject insulin, it starts degrading. Hmm. And so some of it doesn't even get all to the bloodstream. And also, sometimes I overdose. You know, I give myself two units when I only needed one. And then that's when you see us going, I need glucose, I need sugar, I need yeah. juice, I need a piece of fruit, you know, because literally the blood sugar level is dropping to a dangerous level and I, I, you can pass out and die. Mm -hmm. um, so you can pass out and die if you have too much insulin and you can pass out and die if you don't have any insulin. <laughs> right. Yeah. So as with everything in the body, you know, there's that middle, there's that middle ground. Right. Very, very interesting. Um, now, so... For a lot of people, that figuring that window out can be challenging when they add in things like fasting or exercise, I would imagine. Because Absolutely. How does exercise, <laughs> um, you probably need less insulin when you exercise? It's a complicated answer, actually. Yeah. Exercise obviously makes you much more insulin sensitive. Mm. So anybody that is exercising needs, uh, that everybody that's a fit person is going to need less insulin than the same you know, height, weight person that doesn't exercise. Exercise itself just makes the body more efficient, right? So maybe this person for the exact same meal needs two units, but they don't exercise. And this person, exact same height and weight, doesn't exercise. This person only needs one and a half units because it's just efficient. It's a more efficient system. Yeah. So I can get really geeky here, but yeah. on the, the cell receptors are called GLUT4, mm -hmm. glucose transporter four. So GLUT4 receptors are the keyhole, if you will, that insulin is the key for. So insulin is carrying the glucose, it, it connects to a GLUT4 receptor on the cell, opens up the cell and allows the glucose in. Sure. So when you're exercising, not only do the cells upregulate a much higher concentration of GLUT4, so now, it's su now you're super insulin sensitive, yeah. but some of those GLUT4s don't even need insulin. Some of those GLUT4s were just taken in, take in glucose without the presence of insulin. Mm -hmm. Because the body, of course, is so brilliant that it's like, if this person is efforting, and exercising, I want to make taking glucose into the muscles as easy as possible. Right. So the muscles literally can take in glucose without the presence of insulin um, during exercise. So the GLUT4 receptor concentration, up, those GLUT4s upregulate and stay upregulated from 24 to 48 hours after an exercise. Um, and anybody that has more muscle mass in general has more GLUT4s 24 hours a day. So weightlifting specifically for people that want to increase their insulin sensitivity is actually even more important than cardio is more effective than cardio because muscles are so glucose hungry you know cardio is good it burns calories but it's you know the muscles are where all the glycogen storage a big part of your glycogen storage is in your body right mm -hmm. so store glucose because again the body's brilliant in case of famine we need to have some extra fuel well that extra fuel is stored in the muscles right. but if you suddenly start you know lifting weights and doing crossfit and doing push-ups and sit-ups and everything you're you're using up your storage it's kind of like if you had an earthquake and then you had to st stay in your bunker for a week at the end of the week your bunker's going to be empty you're mm -hmm. not going to be you already got to re you got to restock right. so um the more muscle mass anybody has at 24 hours a day the less insulin they'll need 24 hours a day the acute activity of exercise itself depends because if I suddenly just start running around and I'm just doing kind of steady state cardio, mm -hmm. there's no adrenaline there. Um, I'm not really using a lot of muscles. Uh, the little bit of insulin I have in my system, be it the background insulin that's always con constantly there or a recent fast acting shot I did to cover my meal, that insulin will become more powerful. So I will either have to eat to keep from going too low mm. or what I like to make sure I do is actually make sure my insulin level is low before I exercise. I see. So this is life changing to learn this because mm -hmm. as a teenager, 
I wanted to be fit and skinny and pretty and you know, I worked out all the time and I constantly had to eat. They said, anytime if you want your blood sugar level not to drop as somebody with diabetes, you have to eat. And I was eating power bar after power bar after power bar on the elliptical, on the soccer field, on while I was skiing and nobody taught me. And to this day, people are like, oh, if you're gonna exercise, you better eat. Well, no, actually, because you don't have to eat every time you exercise No. at all. You're no. not gonna suddenly have a low blood sugar level that's gonna make you pass out. It's because uh, the exercise is making the insulin so much more powerful that now the insulin is you know, doing its job you know, twice, as, twice as powerful as normal, taking all that glucose out. And so of course I'm gonna drop. But if I don't have too much insulin on my body, I don't have to eat. Right. And I kid you not, this was a miracle for me to learn because mm. I love being active and eating so much while you work out was really getting old. Yeah, I can imagine. So now I just make sure I have very little insulin on board and I don't go low. So you don't go into that dip, the yeah. hypoglycemic yeah. rate, right? Like I said, exercise makes insulin more powerful. Mm. So if you're already in the range, and you have the normal amount of insulin on board, but now you exercise, it's like you just gave yourself a shot. Yeah. So now you're gonna drop. Because of that insulin independent uptake of glucose that you mentioned, how, when exercise, that GLUT4 receptor that's kind of upregulated mm -hmm. on the surface of muscles, you said I think it's really important, that insulin independent uptake of sugar. It's both, with it. okay. both. The GLUT4 is upregulate, independent right. of insulin. So mm -hmm. now just the muscles themselves are taking in more glucose. But the insulin that's there is also more gonna, efficient. It's more, it's more powerful because there's so many GLUT4s that now the, it's so, so easy for the insulin to find a GLUT4. Yeah. Maybe before there was, a, you know, microscopically, right? There's a lag maybe because the insulin has to, if there's less concentration of GLUT4, mm -hmm. the insulin isn't as effective, right. you know? If we, let's say, are doing a high intensity interval, yeah. right? We're sprinting or sure. we're, um, yeah, we're doing sprints. Well, that's so much more adrenaline. Think how much more adrenaline is involved mm -hmm. than if you just go on a brisk walk. Right. You're not really spiking your adrenaline if you go on a brisk walk. Right. But if you're like, okay, ready, go. Or if you're on a race or if you're really anxious, you know, if you're doing a triathlon or if I'm skiing and I'm skiing so fast, I'm like, oh my God, yeah, I'm going or so fast. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Adrenaline is sugar. Yeah. Adrenaline, cortisol. Cortisol is the body's way of like, oh, you are really in an, an intense activity right now. You need more fuel. Yeah. So the body's like, I'm going to help you out here. Cortisol is released from the adrenal glands. Cortisol tells the liver, which is also a major storage place for glycogen, liver and muscle. Mm -hmm. um, so all that glycogen in the liver is now broken down into glucose because that's what cortisol tells the liver to do. And the liver puts all this glucose into the bloodstream. Floods the system. Floods the system. Right. So if I did a CrossFit workout, I can literally go from an 80 to a 180 in 30 minutes. Wow. And will it drop independent? Will you need insulin to get it to drop? Or I might. It totally depends. depends. Yeah. It totally depends on how hungry the muscles are, or, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah. if, you, if you didn't know all the physiology, you might just give yourself insulin. Yeah, and then people have what's called a de um, delayed onset hypoglycemia, mm. which is very complicated because that's, again, that's just a result. The, um, anytime I tell people that are doing CrossFit, they'll have to reduce their insulin for potentially 12 to 24 hours after. Wow. Because, again, it's that you might immediately spike because of the adrenaline, but now, and then maybe you come down because you took a unit, but then you might still go low for the next 24 hours because... All Those, that, the muscle's still taking it up. You're re you have, the muscle now has to refuel its, its storage, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, actually, I used to sell insulin pumps when I, before I went to med school. Mm. And back, that, that was, what year was that? That was 2000. I sold insulin pumps in Seattle and Alaska, Washington State and Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a hockey player who was really, you know, it, back then, well, even now, pumps, a lot, athletes really... Um, love insulin pumps because there's a lot more fine-tuning capabilities than shots. Mm -hmm. um, I can fine-tune just fine. I'm very athletic, but yet I hate wearing all that contraption yeah. on me. It's just more hassle. So, but anyways, a patient uh, was a professional hockey player and I, he was having a horrible time with his blood sugar levels. And I wasn't a type 1 diabetes specialist back then. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I wasn't giving him medical advice. I was just trying to get him on a pump. Um, but um, he died. Mm, because he went to the hypoglycemic crash. He and... played a really intense hockey game one night and uh, didn't wake up that night. Oh my gosh, that was terrible. Did he, he was not wearing the pump at that time? Uh, no, he hadn't. It he was, was an approved jet. Yeah. Ah. And when you're, 
on a pump, you can turn down the insulin a lot easier. Once you do a shot, how do you turn it down? Yeah. I, I actually know how to turn it down, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> sure. Gosh, that's really scary. Um, well, there, I think there's a lot of things that we can kind of unpack from just that, that last segment, but I think yeah. what's most exciting is just the fact that exercise, that a hard workout like that can make you more insulin sensitive for up to 48 hours. Yes. So I think, I mean, there's a lot for non-diabetics to, to get information. Yes. I and mean, that's a great tip. So my, my kind of follow-up question to that would be, how quickly do you notice, like if you travel and go visit family and you're not doing your you know, Sun Valley active yes. lifestyle, how quickly do you notice that you need to have more insulin? Take more insulin yeah. on day three. Wow. Anytime you don't work out for, for two days in a row, you're going to go higher on day three. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell my patients, you know, at minimum, if you want to keep your insulin sensitivity at its highest, you should at least work out every other day. Yeah. And that's true for everybody. It's, right. it's no different. Like what the mechanism is because of how GLUT4 receptors af work after exercise. Mm -hmm. So my GLUT4 receptors work just like yours. Yeah, same. They come up when I exercise and they stay up for a day or two. Right. So every other day. That's so I incredible. noticed, yeah. I'm certainly not the average diabetic. The average person with type 1 diabetes is actually very out of, out of range most of the time. Um, they're on much bigger doses. They're eating as many carbs as they want, taking as t big, huge dose of insulin. Less than 25% of the 3 million type 1 people um, with diabetes in this country have um, decent blood sugar levels. Wow. 75% are out of control. Crazy. And that is why I've created the career I have. I only work with type 1 diabetics virtually. I can work with I have patients all over the country. I have patients all over the world. I have patients in China and Saudi Arabia. And it's fabulous because most physicians, it's a very complex disease and most physicians just frankly haven't been trained. Or don't have the time. To do it. Yeah. They either don't have the time if they know, but not very many know, yeah. um, or they literally have not been trained. The, all they've been trained is like, hey, try to keep your sugar down and take this insulin every day. Mm -hmm. That's it. But there's so many fine. Nobody told me that, okay, if you, if you brisk walk, you know, your sugar level is going to go down like this, but if you do CrossFit, it can go up like this and they go down later. Mm -hmm. If you ski, it can go up. So if you use your muscles really, if you do anaerobic, it can go up because adrenaline, mm -hmm. you know, if you do intensity, it can go up because, you know, nobody told me all these fine, if you get sick, your insulin sensitivity crashes down because mm -hmm. all of the hormones, the inf if you have to take a steroid shot, you can't get your sugar level down for four days or more. You know, there's all these fine tunes. You can have a high blood sugar level before you even get symptoms of a cold. So suddenly your sugar level is high all day today. You're like, what? I'm not even eating and I'm 200. Mm -hmm. And then the next day you're coughing and sneezing and you're like, oh, it's an infection. Right. There's, I have a seven page handout all the reasons why you can go high and low that have nothing to do with food. That is so cool. Oh my gosh, <laughs> we're, we're gonna have fun talking about this. I think people don't understand that connection between um, you know, inflammation and dysglycemia and blood sugar dysregulation. Oh, so so that, that is so, so fascinating. So, but just like sitting around is inflammatory. Like you said, if you don't exercise for three days, you need more insulin. You got the cold. Um, yeah. Well, your boyfriend broke his leg, so he probably, if he was diabetic, might need more he insulin. He is diabetic. Oh my gosh. Okay. So he needs more <laughs> insulin, yeah? So he met me mm. and I'm a type 1 specialist. We met at a type 1 event. Yeah. And um, then he took everything I teach to heart more than I take it to heart. Mm. And his numbers are now better than mine. Yeah. Wow. However, he uh, broke his leg uh, six days ago and then had surgery yesterday and he's on a bunch of pain pills and this fit active guy is has hasn't gotten out of bed all day except to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. his blood sugar level was 250 when he woke up this morning he wow. gave himself a disgustingly huge dose of insulin two hours later it was 190. whoa so it's just all those it's things it's a combination of he's not actually he's not even moving mm -hmm. so his insulin sensitivity is in the toilet and then there's all those inflammatory hormones. Yeah. You know, he just had surgery. His whole leg is, you know. Inflamed. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the body, it, it's, it's not responding very well to his insulin at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. What about sleep? We know sleep plays a huge role in insulin sensitivity and circadian rhythms. Um, how do you notice if, if maybe you have a bad night's sleep or if your alarm goes off or, or whatever, you're traveling to a different time zone, how, how does that affect your insulin? You know, I, I get really good sleep. 
But as a, as a whole, um, if you're constantly stressed out and fatigued because not enough sleep, you're definitely going to have more stress hormones going on. It's a more of an inflammatory condition, right? Because we sleep in order to decrease inflammation. We sleep to have regeneration happening throughout the body and then, you know, just have lower inflammation. The body is in repair mode, right? If it's repairing something and suddenly the alarm goes off, it's like, wait, I'm not done repairing this. It mm -hmm. still needs my help. And now you're off to the races. You're just going to have more inflammatory hormones going on. So yeah. you're going to have a higher, I don't really notice from night to night. I mean, there's so many variables that affect my sugar level yeah. and I have such tight control that I'm like, did it take me up to 90 today instead of 80? I don't know, maybe. Um, but yes, just in general, sleep causes a lot of more inflammation and stress and so you'll have lower insulin sensitivity for sure yeah you mentioned um stress earlier and i was curious on that like the correlation between adrenal issues and you know the the spectrum of adrenal fatigue or kind of hpa mm -hmm. axis dysfunction and blood sugar dysregulation because you talked about uh, adrenaline and cortisol and how they're needed to kind of liberate and free up blood sugar yes and you talked about kind of you know in your 20s where things were bouncing around because yeah. you didn't have this information is there a correlation there between the, the adrenal dysfunction and blood sugar dysregulation do they kind of go hand in hand or how does that work well stress is going to raise your blood sugar yeah either on a chronic level or acute um, I just recently gave a TEDx talk. Mm -hmm. And so, as you can imagine, my adrenaline and my stress. So, I increased my insulin that morning uh, for sure. Yeah. Because just to counteract that. But it's a stress response if, you know, I'm stressed or if I'm stressed skiing, stressed skiing. Yeah. You know, any stress to the body, be it good stress or bad stress, can, can, reduce, can release cortisol, which then will really increase glucose and you'll need more insulin for you'll need more insulin. people okay so have you noticed um some of your clients and patients you know when they start doing yoga and meditating and things like that 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 alone oh yes affects your insulin oh those? yeah that is so cool yeah and yeah. then of course like i have this one patient right now who um who's been quote trying everything for her weight loss mm -hmm. but meanwhile she's been just stressed running around like you know all day long mm -hmm. and so and also very self-critical and i'll explain to her and like first of all i my philosophy is that you have to love yourself into healing. You can't shame yourself into healing. Right. You can't say, you fat pig, why are you so fat? You better lose weight. It's not going to work, right. right? You have to be very kind and compassionate to yourself. So just my two approaches with her have been like, let's be more loving and let's be more calm. I don't, you don't have to change your food. You don't have to change your exercise. I just want you to love yourself and meditate. Mm -hmm. And she's lost, I think, 25 pounds. That is so awesome. That is so cool. I love hearing that. Yeah, a lot of the uh, personal development is totally off topic, but uh, in the personal development space and mindset space, talk about that. You know, like just futures on your body that maybe you don't like, whether it's your nose or your eyes or whatever, mm -hmm. just look in the mirror and say, you know, I, I love my nose or I love my eyes. And, um, and then you start to have a deeper appreciation for your body. So it's, it's really interesting that you say that and then yeah. showing the effects with the, with the weight loss. Um, As a holistic physician, yeah. I mean, everybody I work with is type one and it's anybody, they can live anywhere in the world. So if you have type one and you want to work with me, that's fine. I would yeah. love it. Um, however, I don't just focus on diabetes. So I always say, how are your four pillars? And the four pillars are the foundation for your well-being, right? Your, your, your mindset, mm -hmm. your emotional health, your spirituality, your connection, your love for yourself, uh, sleep, exercise and food. Sometimes we don't even, my patients and I, we don't even talk about their blood sugar levels. Yeah. Sometimes it's all emotional stress, meditation or something like that. That's great. Yeah. I love that. That's huge. Um, so there, there's a debate going on in kind of the low carb ketogenic world about whether or not insulin contributes to weight gain and, and whether carbs and then insulin lead to weight gain or, or it's just too much calories. So I love to know, you said about 20, only 25% of the 3 million some odd type 1 diabetics have normal glycemia, right? Yes. And, and manage it and all that sort of stuff. The other, we can say 75% are probably using too much insulin. Yeah. You know? So is there a higher prevalence of obesity and overweight in type 1 diabetics that don't have good glycemic regulation? It's a very fair assumption to make, absolutely. Um, all my patients are well controlled, so I have the 25%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nice. In general, even if somebody is on an insulin pump versus injections, an insulin pump is much more efficient mm -hmm. at giving insulin. So it is seen that oftentimes when people switch from injections to insulin pump, um, you take 20% less insulin in general on a pump than on shots. Hmm. Um, and people tend to lose weight. Yeah. So yes. Um, uh, 
excess insulin is going to make you gain weight. I mean, in years of, you know, you've been diabetic since you were seven. Yes. You've treated a lot of patients. So you would just say in general, there's a correlation between insulin use and weight gain. Absolutely. Like excessive insulin use and weight gain. Yeah. 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 And it's a very vicious cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Because also the more weight you gain, the weaker your insulin sensitivity is. So uh, if you are 150 pounds today and then 160 pounds in a month or two, you need more insulin. I don't care if you eat the same, I don't care if you exercise the same, but the second you gain weight, you need more insulin. A lot of my patients, and that's another one of the points on my handout, is people are like, why is my insulin not working? And I'm like, well, it was the holidays. Did you gain weight? I'm like, well, I gained seven pounds. I'm like, you're gonna have to increase your insulin. Wow. So it's a vicious cycle. Then they take more insulin, then they have more weight, you know? it's mm -hmm. So the re I'm not worried about being on a pump because you know, I'm on 20 units a day. If I go on a pump, I'll be on 18, 17 units a day, 16. It's, right. I mean, it's, I'm not on 30 or 40, 50 units a day, so mm -hmm. it's not gonna make a big difference. For you, yeah, yeah. That, that three unit. But do you worry that, that people, if they're self-injecting insulin, it might be too much. What are the risks of that with cancer and pro-growth and things? Is there a higher prevalence of, of different comorbidities? Um, there, yes, there is um, a higher risk of certain cancers. Because I focus so much on my patients, right now on getting their getting them healthier yeah. to be honest you would think as a type 1 expert i would know all the facts about that i just feel like what we need to do that's the that's the bad dead end that you don't want to get to yeah. so i don't really want to know about it i want to just help you right now and to right. be honest as a type 1 myself i've avoided doing that research yeah um, i do know there's certain cancers that i've heard that we get more often but i really just for my own personal Self, I don't research that. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the brain. You said, bring, bring me back to that point. Yes. We were talking about the brain can just soak up soak glucose. Let's revisit that. Well, so. have you heard that Alzheimer's is called type three diabetes? We have, yeah. Amy Berger, do you know her? She wrote the book, The Alzheimer's Antidote. So we've interviewed her before and talked oh, about insulin degrading enzyme in the brain. We talked all about this, but I'd love to know your perspective. I think this is fascinating. Too much glucose is gonna kill brain cells. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah. And the nerves don't have GLUT4 receptors. They don't need them. If my blood sugar level is high, there's too much glucose in my brain. There's no way to block it. So it, and I can clearly tell, uh, when I'm high in the moment, I, I can't think clearly. Like I, the brain is, doesn't, if you have too much sugar in your bloodstream, you have too much damage in your brain. So Period. when you were talking about like peripheral neuropathy and diabetic, like amputations and all that, mm -hmm. so too much blood, blood sugar, it's damaging things. And, and one of the tests that we can look at, people know about the hemoglobin A1C, the yes. glycolytic aspect. So that glycation is happening in the brain? Yes. Wow. And now that obviously is not good because it's damaging neurons yeah. that we need to think and process. Yeah. And there's Sorry. certain pathways. Um, there's microvascular complica complications. There's macrovascular um something if i remember the exact science of how it works it's not only the glycation but it's like too much glucose inside the cell then turns into sorbitol and then there's like the sorbitol pathway and you know then the body can't the cell can't rid itself of sorbitol and it's it just kind of ends up you know if i could i, I wish i had remembered oh, before that's fine. i came here we can, put, we, can let, we can redo that too much glucose yeah. kills cells yeah so Bottom there's line. there's a couple different mechanisms by how it does it sure um and i don't remember the different specifics of mechanisms but too much glucose the main the main uh complications involved with anybody with diabetes type 1 or type 2 because yeah. it's just if you have high blood sugar it doesn't yeah. matter if you're type 1 or type 2 heart disease strokes kidney failure, blindness, Alzheimer's, and gangrene leading mm. to limb amputations, and also uh, soft tissue injuries, rotator cuff injuries, trigger finger, uh, because it definitely, um, it binds to the soft tissue and then it makes it stiff. Hmm. I don't know trigger finger. So you, you, it kind of locks up? Yeah. It, like yeah. the fascia gets sticky. Mm -hmm, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, carpal tunnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, uh, Shalini Bat, who was a, she's a chiropractor in Ontario, and she talks about that and how she, she does a lot of like soft tissue work. And she, and she got some flack from people on YouTube that are non medical professionals, but, you know, she can tell people's blood sugar regulation, she says, you know, just through her body work and just by yeah. the fascia. It's that sticky. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome that, that you agree with that. And, and that, that does make sense, you know, now that you're talking about that, that um, trigger figure. Yeah. Very, very interesting stuff. I'd just like to explain the hemoglobin A1C. Yeah, I would love so to. So hemoglobin, 
um, is a protein in the red blood cell and the glucose will stick to that. So in when the blood sugar level is elevated and the red blood cells live anywhere from two, three, four months. So when you're taking a hemoglobin A1C, you are getting a sample of red blood cells and you're just seeing how much glucose is stuck to them. And that gives you the quote average of what your blood sugar level has been over the past you know, few months. But to be honest, there's many reasons why the A1C is inaccurate. Um, I just went to a, a, a diabetes conference where they, he predicted anywhere from 16 to 25% of lab values of A1Cs are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any sort of red blood cell disorder, depends if your red blood cells, you know, do they only live two months, do they live four months? Um, and everybody has different glycation rates. Somebody yeah. that's 200 has a different glycation rate than somebody else that's 200. So um, actually the best average now is taking wearing one of these glucose monitors and downloading the data and getting the average because that's actually reading the blood sugar level and you just take the average of that. Um, that is specifically a blood sugar average as opposed to just extrapolating it from what's stuck to the red blood cell. Mm -hmm. What's stuck to the red blood cell isn't isn't the same. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a lot of reasons why, how much it sticks to the red blood cell. So there's data that shows, you know, somebody's average is 200 and their A1C is, um, that would be, let's see, 200 correlates to about seven, or um, I think high, higher than seven, but okay. this person has an average of 200 and their A1C is here. This person has an average of 200 and their A1C is here. Mm. So, Huge disparity, so yeah. there is a disparity. Now I'm not yeah. saying it's a bad test. I sure. still think it's very important to get it done, but you could also have somebody who's low half the time and high half the time with the 6% or somebody that is constantly perfect and has a 6%, right? Mm. Because it only looks at average. Right. So I have plenty of patients that will say, hey, my A1C is really good, but I know my numbers are awful. Mm -hmm. And it's because half the time they're having low blood sugar levels and half the time they're having high. Mm. So there are some down, there is some issues with A1C. I think that's a great tip. You know, I, I did see some of that research coming out in uh, 2011, haven't followed it, but that, that the hemoglobin A1C was in question, you know, based upon yeah. on some of the things that, that you mentioned. So I think that's great because for some people, you know, they, they get their blood work once a year and if their hemoglobin A1C is over like 5.5, they're like, oh, my blood sugar is great. I don't need to worry about it. You know, but like you said, I think really taking that next step, getting a continuous glucose monitor, seeing where things are mm -hmm. at, you know, if you speculate and, and all that sort of thing. Let's um, see what my glucose monitor is. Let's do it. Is. Yeah, it's been probably <laughs> more than 20 minutes. Dun, dun, dun. 112. So yeah. it's definitely headed up. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So a little bit more of a lag, but always a lag. So, mm -hmm. you know, the meter was 125, Right. but this was 103, I think, or 104 or something. It was. Yeah. So now, so my hope now is that the I am shot, um, right you down know, touch. just, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Interesting. That is really cool. So if you're yeah. sleeping and you go say below 80, it's going to wake you up. Like uh -huh. it beeps that much. Yeah. Okay. I sent, I, I set the alerts uh, so I can, it? yeah, I have patients come to me and their high alert is set at 250. Oh my gosh. Which means they don't get any warning until they're 250. Whoa. And I'm like, well, who said it like that? And they're like, oh, my doctor. I'm like, oh, why? my lord, yeah. Because they don't want they don't want their patient to die on them, which is mm. fair. So they would rather have them run high. Yeah. Because high is not going to kill you right now unless you have no insulin. But if you have some insulin and you're high, you'll live, right? Mm -hmm. You'll just have go blind eventually or sure. lose a toe or foot. Right. But if you go low, I could die right now. Mm -hmm. So most physicians are very conservative, and they want their especially the kids. Um, they, they want them to run higher and running high also, um, stunts growth, you know, and it's so funny to me because there's a lot of debates that they're like, Oh, you know, a child, a child needs 150 grams of carb. So you need to give them 50 grams of carb at every meal. Mm. And I've had newly diagnosed parents, you know, their four year old gets diagnosed and they were already eating keto or low carb. Mm. And now they're being told they need to eat 50 grams of carb per meal. And I had this one mom, mother in tears and she's like, I can't, I, ref I can't, you know, yeah, what am I and there's two problems with that. Yeah. One is that 50 grams of carb is not necessary because there's no such thing as essential carbohydrates, right? right? There's essential amino acids, essential fatty acids. There's no such thing as essential carbohydrate. Right. I've eaten a piece of halibut, no insulin and seen my blood sugar level go up 75 points. Whoa. What do you attribute that to? Protein is turned into glucose. Mm -hmm. Protein can easily be turned into glucose. If right. the body is not given carb at a meal, it can take protein and turn it into glucose. Mm. So the actual amino acid sequence, broken down, digested, can be created into a glucose. 
Now, have you found, carrying along with that gluconeogenesis, you know, topic, is it, have you found fish is more gluconeogenic than say beef or eggs or any other types of Well, you also have to think about how much fat is in the meal because Mm. fat can, fat won't raise the blood sugar level like protein does directly. Fat raises it indirectly because once the fat is digested into fatty acids, the fatty acids go into the bloodstream and now they can stay there for several hours. Digestion might be done in two or three or four hours, Mm -hmm. but digestion is simply the food is out of the GI tract, right? Once those part, those food pieces are broken into the microscopic um, elements and molecules that we need goes into the bloodstream. Now you have a whole train of fatty acids circulating. Mm -hmm. Well, those fatty acids in the bloodstream make insulin sensitivity drop. Mm. So if you're going to have some big high fatty meal, it it will make your insulin sensitivity weaker. I see. Now I know in the keto world, obviously there's a lot of fat involved. Um, and one thing that bothers me is some people immediately go, well, then fat is bad. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, no, you know, I don't think to say anything is bad, but we have to just be aware of what it does you know, and, and adjust. Right. So carb, you know, is not bad, but if you're eating, you know, fruit loops all day, yes. Yeah. If you're having an apple, no. Right. But anyway, so they tell them to eat 50 grams of carb a day, which is not necessary. There's mm-hmm. no, they don't need that many to grow. Yeah. Um, but meanwhile, those 50 grams are causing them to have two fifties and they say, well, they need those carbs cause they need to grow. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Do you realize that 250 will not allow them to grow? Right. And so they put more stress on the 50 grams of carb as being more important for their growth. And they ignore this. Hmm. And I'm like, uh, no, it stunts growth. It stunts growth. So I tell my pa- my parents, I said, eat, the- feed them low carb, get their blood sugar levels at a healthy range and monitor their growth by, are they growing? Yeah. How is their energy? And how are they functioning in school? I literally have this mother feed their child very low carb and is stressed every day. And I have to tell her every day, is he growing? Yes. Is he doing well in school? Yes. And because they just push carb. Mm -hmm. And so not only are they ignoring the damage of the high blood sugar level, but of course, how do most kids fill their 50 gram carb need? Cereal bread. Well, junk. mom, I ate a pack of Skittles. That was 30 grams. Then right. I, you know, had a Slurpee. That was 30, 50 grams. Yeah. They're not eating silly. black beans. Right. They're not eating, you know, broccoli yeah. for their carb gram. That is wild. <laughs> it's just a carb. You just got to get 50 carbs. Okay. <laughs> 50 carbs of Skittles. Good for you. Right, right. Gosh, that is so crazy. Isn't that crazy? That is, that is really wild. Um, we covered a lot of ground. I'm really grateful for this conversation, Dr. Jody. Um, one thing I would love to address that we didn't really talk about is, is maybe pre- prevention. Do you ever, mm. you know, talk to, to, to parents, patients about that, like immune tolerance and, you know, uh, allergens and yes, autoimmune? Yes, yes, that's a great, great question. Yeah. yeah. So that is one thing that I'm hoping I will soon be known for sure. um, is beta cell preservation. So, and of course you're not talking about type two prevention because I feel like that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, but type one prevention, absolutely. So, um, like I said, I work with patients virtually all over the world. And so I love it when new people find me because this isn't talked about beta cell preservation isn't talked about. No, it isn't. No. And so number one is if you broke your leg, don't go on a run. You know, if your beta cells are dying out, don't, don't force them to work hard. So what does that mean? Eat low low carb. carb. Yeah. Obvious. Number two is anything above a 120 or 140 actually kills beta cells itself. Glucotoxicity. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And the beta cells, some cells are more um, resilient against, or, you know, have a more of a buffer against the high glucose, not the beta cells. Hmm. So the very high glucose itself is killing the beta cells. So a lot of my patients, my newly diagnosed kids will come to me and their A1C at diagnosis is 10 or 12. Oh my gosh. Because they've been six, seven hundred, and didn't know, mm-hmm. and they will get dosed insulin the day they are diagnosed, and then they luckily, hopefully, find me right away. I'm like, okay, you guys, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do low carb. We're not gonna do 50 grams per meal. And then a month later, they're like, he's having lows all the time. He's mm-hmm. having lows every day, and I'll say it's time to drop your insulin by 50 yeah. percent because the beta cells were so beaten up at diagnosis with the 12 A1C, mm-hmm. but now. In a month, I've gotten them into the 80 to 120 range and the beta cells are coming back. The beta cells are happy. And I'm like, yes, drop the insulin. You don't need as much. You've got more beta cells back. 
So that's step number two, is we've got to get them in the normal range to, to not have the glucose itself be toxic. Um, and then of course, weight train, yep. more muscle mass. Um, there's certain supplements that can help support the beta cells. So I have a whole beta cell preservation supplement protocol awesome. shown to increase beta cell mass. Hmm. And so as you can see, all those four things are just protecting the beta cells. Yeah. So there's not, no further damage. Yes. Yeah. They're not reversing autoimmunity, yeah. right? Um, that's gut healing. 70% of the immune cells are in the gut, yeah. right? So if the immune system is not acting well, it's very likely that there's something going on in the gut that's not well because right. they're, they share the same house, yeah. you know? So I like to do a whole gut healing protocol and um, get those autoantibodies down, get the inflammation down. Um, I always run food allergy tests, um, get them on an anti-inflammatory, avoid gluten, that's mm -hmm. already been proven to lower the incidence of, ty of, of type one. Um, I'm a little bit softer on dairy, but there's a lot of, you know, goat and coconut and things like that. But mm -hmm. um, get on uh, anti-inflammatory diet, do a whole gut healing protocol. That's so awesome. I have, um, I just talked to a patient who uh, was n newly diagnosed and I got them on my protocol. And then they're like, we love low carb, mm -hmm. you know? And Wait. they had a package of three phone calls with me and uh, they've only used two. Cause they're like, he's not on insulin. Wow. So you basically stopped it in its tracks, like stop yeah. the stop the immune system from degrading the beta cells. Yeah. He isn't cured mm -hmm. because he's eating very low carb and he's taking the supplements. I see. He's not eating pizza and not on insulin. He yeah. is not on insulin because whatever percentage of his beta cells that he has left are functioning. Mm -hmm. Now, would it be great if they grow back 100%? Great. Yeah. And there's a test that you can see at how, how the strength of your beta cells. There is something that I, that there is a test that you can do. Wow. Um, so. He isn't cured, but a type one diabetic isn't diagnosed until 80% of their beta cells are dead. Hmm. So at diagnosis, you have 20% left. Mm -hmm. So then if we get on the beta cell preservation protocol and we get to 30 or 40 and then stay there with my protocol, yeah. you know, we, you can manage, you can live that way, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now yeah. the only problem is he's, this child is seven. And so puberty hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And where puberty causes immense insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. In both boys and girls? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Teenagers need a massive amount of insulin. Because hmm. it's kind of like they're sick every day. Yeah. You know? Oh my gosh, that is incredible. <laughs> that is wild. Um, so what will be your one question we, we kind of ask every guest on the show is your favorite herb, nutrient, or botanical? Uh, so for, when, in the context of, of blood sugar regulation, mm -hmm. What comes to mind? Berberine is hot on the street right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. Um, but what's your favorite? What's most effective? Well, so to not repeat what I'm sure a lot of your guests said, specifically yeah. I'll stay on this line of thinking. For beta cell preservation, it's gymnema. Mm, gymnema nice. has been shown to increase beta cell mass. Interesting. Yeah. That, that's in a lot of blood sugar formulas yeah. already, huh? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, what exercise? If, if, if newly diagnosed or someone has a friend or family with type 1 diabetes, they just said, what's, is it weight training? Is it CrossFit? Is it skiing? Like it's just it's weight training. It's hands down. building muscle mass. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah. The more muscle mass you have, the more efficient your insulin is. Love it. Fantastic. And if you were in an elevator with a politician or uh, <laughs> someone from the parliament of, oh, of another gosh. World Health Organization that said, Dr. Jody, if there's just one lifestyle or health tip you would want us to like influence some policy around, what would it be? Eat whole food that nature grew. Yeah. and not processed foods. Brilliant. Yeah. Love it. Fantastic. Simple. So you have the TED Talk, which we'll put in the show notes below this. And Great. then um, where can folks find you online? So my website is Dr. Jody ND. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to spell that? Or will oh, no, no, uh, J-O-D-I. Why? Why? Okay. And then N, yeah. naturopathic D doctor. Yeah. Brilliant. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the show. This yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. All yeah. right, guys, if you like the show, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and click on the links below so you can connect with Dr. Jody. Yes. And one last comment yeah, is um, anybody that wants to talk to me, I offer free calls. So you can find the link for having a free intro call because I like to just kind of make sure we're a good fit before we work together. And then I work together in just a series of phone or Skype appointments. But um, I always start with a free call. So Brilliant. anybody can sign Super up for that. Smart. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. Yeah.